Meadow creatures, get you home. Is this a holiday? What? Now you're not being mechanical? You ought not walk upon a laboring day without the sign of your profession. Speak. What trade art thou? Why, ma'am, a carpenter. Where is that other apron in thy room? What thou art thou wear that best apparel on? Uh, you, sir, what trade art thou? Truly, sir, in respect to the finer workmen, I am but, as you would say, a cobbler. But what trade art thou? Answer me directly. A trade, sir, that I hope I may use in clear conscience, which is indeed, sir, a mender of bad souls. But what trade, thou knave? Thou naughty knave? What trade? Nay, madam, I beseech you, be not out with me. But if you be out with me, I can mend you. <laughs> what mints have I had? Mend me, my saucy fellow? Why, sir, cobble you. <laughs> no, art a cobbler, art thou? Truly, madam, all that I live by is with thee all. I meddle in no tradesmen's affairs nor women, but with all. I am a surgeon to old shoes. When they are in danger, I recover them. As proper men as ever trod upon neat's leather have gone upon my handiwork. <laughs> Wherefore art not in thy shop today? Why dost thou leave these people about the streets? <laughs> well, truly, madam, to wear out their shoes to get myself into more work. But indeed, madam, we may holiday to see Caesar and to rejoice in his triumphs. What for rejoice? What conquest brings him home? What tributary followed him to Rome? To graze and kept the bonds in his chariot wheels? You fox, you stones, you worst of senseless things! <coughs> oh, you hard parts, you crewmen of Rome. No, you're not Pompey. Many a time and often you climb up the walls, the battlements, the towers, the windows, ye, the chimney tops, with your infants in your arms, and there have stayed the live long day when patient expectations to see great Pompey pass the streets of Rome. And when you saw this cherry but appear, have you not made a universal shout that Tiber trembled underneath her banks to hear the replication of her sounds made by her concave shores? And do you now wear your best attire on? And do you now call out a holiday? And do you now strew flowers in this way that comes in tragic for Pompey's blood? Be gone! Run to houses full of fun to me. Pray to the gods to determine the plague that needs the light on this ingratitude. Go, go, good countrymen, and for this fault, assemble all the poor of your sort, draw them to the banks of the Tiber, and weave your tears into the lowest channel, to the lowest stream that sees the most exalted shore of all. Oh, see how their faces metal be not moved. They vanish tongue tight in their guiltiness. You go down that way toward the capital. This way will I. Describe any images if you so do find them decked with ceremonies. Attention unit directors and personnel. Feed will go live shortly. All camera crew to their stations. All candidates please remain within limits and rehearsed positions. Keynote address personnel should report to the stage wing for keynote speech. Caesar says do this, it is done. <laughs> Sit on. We no ceremony out. Caesar! Ah, who calls? Bid every noise be still. Peace yet again. Who is it in this press that calls on me? I hear a tongue shrill and all the music cry, Caesar, speak. <coughs> Caesar's turn to hear. Beware the Ides of March! What person is this? This soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Now set her before me. Let me see your face. Come from the throng, look upon Caesar. What sayest thou to me now? Speak once again. Beware the eyes of March. She's a dreamer. Let's leave her. Pass. Will you go see the order of the course? 
Not I. I pray you do. Oh, I am not game so. I do lack some part of that uh, quick spirit that is an Antony. Oh, let me not hinder Cassie's your desires. I'll leave you. Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not seen from your eyes the gentleness and show of love as I want to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. If I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself, which give some soil perhaps to my behaviors, but let not therefore my good friends be grieved, among which number Cassius be you one. Nor construe any further my neglect than that poor Brutus, with himself at war, forgets the shows of love to other men. Then, Brutus, I have missed a compassion by means whereof this breast of mine have buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. Tell me, Brutus, can you see your face? Not Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other things. Tis just. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus, and groaning under this age's yoke, have wished that Brutus had his eyes. Into what dangers would you lead me, Cassius? That you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me? Then, Brutus, be prepared to hear, since you cannot see yourself as well as by reflection, that I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you yet not know of. Means the shouting. I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king. I do fear it. Then must I think you would not have it so? I would not, Cassius. Yet I love him well. Uh, but wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it that you would impart to me? If it be aught toward the general good, set honor in one eye and death in the other, and I will look on both indifferently. For let the gods so speed me as I love the name of honor more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I was born as free as Caesar. So were you. We have both fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once, Upon a raw and custy day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, leap with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Upon the word, the captain as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. And indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it, with lusty sinews throwing it aside. But ere we arrived at the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink! And I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear. So from the waves of Tiber did I, the tired Caesar. And this man has now become a god. And Cassius but a wretched creature would defend her body of Caesar, but so carelessly not on her. He had a fever when he was in Spain. And when the fit was on him, I did mark how she did shake. Tis true, this god did shake. His coward lips did from their color fly. That same eye who's been up. All the world did lose its luster. I did hear him groan, and that tongue, who but to paint the Romans, mark him right as speeches in their books. Alas, it cried, give me some drink, Titanius. As a sick girl, ye gods, it doth amaze me. A man of such feeble temper should so be the start of a majestic one and bear the palm alone. I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped on Caesar. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, as we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should his name be sounded more than yours? Write them together. Yours is just his fair name. Rome, thou hast lost the breed of noble bloods. When went there by an age since the great flood? It was founded by just one man. And when could they say till now that the doctor Rome that her wide walls encompassed but one man? Well, it is indeed Rome and room enough. When was in it but one man? Brutus, you and I have heard our fathers say. There was a Brutus once who would have worked the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. That you do love me, I am nothing jealous. What you would work me to, 
I have some aim. How I've thought of this and of these times, I shall recount hereafter. For this present, I would not. So with love, I might entreat you be any further moved. What you have said, I will consider. What you have to say, I will with patience hear, and find the time both me to hear and answer such high things. Uh, till then, my noble friend, chew upon this. Brutus had rather be a villager than to repute himself a son of Rome under these hard conditions, as this time is like to lay upon us. I am glad that my weak words have struck but thus much show of fire from Brutus. The games are done, Caesar's returning. As they pass by, put Casca by the sleeve, and he will, after his sour fashion, tell us what hath proceeded where you know today. I will do so. But look you, Cassius, the angry spot doth glow on Caesar's brow, and all the rest look like a chidden drain. Calpurnia's cheek is pale, and Cicero looks with such ferret and such fiery eyes as we have seen him in the capital, being crossed in conference by some senators. Casco will tell us what the matter is. Caesar, my lord. Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men of such a sleep of nights. The Aunt Cassius is a lean and hungry look. She thinks too much. Such people are dangerous. Fear her not, Caesar. She's not dangerous. She's a noble Roman and well given. Which you're fattering. But I fear her not. Yet, if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I would avoid so soon as I spare Cassius. She reads much. She's a great observer and she looks quite through the deeds of men. She loves no plays as thou dost Antony. She, she hears no music. Seldom she smiles and smiles in such a sort as if she mocked herself and scorned her spirit to be moved to smile at anything. Such people as she be never heart's ease when they behold a greater than themselves. Therefore are they very dangerous. I'd rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear for always. I am Caesar. Come on my right hand, for this here is death. Tell me truly what thou thinkst of. Hold me by the foot, would you speak with me? Ah, Cassia, tell us what a chance today that Caesar looks so sad. Why, there was a crown offered him, and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand thus. And the people fell to shouting. Well, what was the second noise for? Why, for that, too. They shouted thrice. What was the last cry for? Why, for that, too. Was the crown offered him thrice? Aye, thrice it was. And thrice he put it by, each time gentler than the last. And at every putting by, mine honest neighbor shouted. Who offered him the crown? Why, Antony. Uh, tell us the manner of it, gentle Casca. I can as well be hanged as tell the manner of it. It was mere foolery. I did not mark it. I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown. Not a crown, neither. T'was one of these coronets. And as I told you, he put it by, but for all that to my thinking, he would fain have had it. Then he offered it a second time, and then he put it a second time by, but to my thinking, he was loath to lay his fingers off it. And then he offered it the third time, and the third time he put it by. And still, as he refused the crown, the rabblemen hooted and clapped their chapped hands and threw up their sweaty nightcaps and uttered such a deal of stinking breath because Caesar had refused the crown, that it almost choked Caesar, for he swooned and fell down at it. And for my own part, I durst not laugh, for fear of opening my lips and receiving bad air. But stop, I pray you, what did Caesar swoon? Aye, he swooned and fell down at the marketplace, and foamed at the mouth and was speechless. Tis very like. He hath the falling sickness. No, he hath it not. But you and I, honest Casca, we have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that, but I am sure Caesar fell down. And if the tag-rag people did not clap and hiss according as he pleased and displeased them, as they used to the players in the theater, I am no true man. <laughs> well, what said he when he came unto himself? Mary, before he fell down, when he perceived the common herd was glad he'd refused the crown, he plucked me, opened his doublet, and offered them his throat to cut. <laughs> and I had been a man of any occupation. If I had not taken him at a word, I would, I might go to hell among the rogues. <laughs> and so he fell. And when he came to himself, he said, if he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worships to think it his infirmity. Three or four wenches where I stood cried, alas, good soul, and forgave him with all their hearts. But there's no heed to be taken of that. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. And, and he came thus sad away. Aye. Did Cicero say anything? 
Ay, he spoke Greek. To what effect? Nay, and I'll tell you that, I'll never look you in the face again, but those that understood it smiled at each other and nodded. But for mine own part, it was Greek to me. <laughs> I will give you news. Morellus and Flavius, for pulling down scarves from Caesar's images, are put to silence. Very well, both. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. Will you sup with me tonight, Caslin? No, I'm promised for it. Will you dine with me tomorrow? Aye, if I be alive and your mind hold and the dinner be worth the eating. Good, I will expect you. Do so. Farewell, both. <laughs> what a blunt fellow this has grown to be. He was quick metal when he went to school. As is he now in execution of any bold or noble enterprise. However, he puts on this tardy form. His rudeness is a sauce to his good wit, which give men stomachs to digest his words with better appetite. And so it is. For this time, I will leave you. Tomorrow, if you please to speak with me, I will come home to you. Or, if you will, come home to me and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Oh, Brutus, thou art noble. Yet I see the honorable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Caesar doth bear me hard, but he loves Brutus. If I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, he would not humor me so. I would, this night, in several hands and at his windows, as if they came from several citizens, write all tending to the same opinion that Rome holds of his name, wherein obscurely Caesar's ambition shall be glancing. And after this, let Caesar seat him short, or we will shake him, or worse than him do. Tosca brought you Caesar home. Why are you so breathless and why stare you so? Are you not moved when all the sway of earth shakes like a thing unfirmed? Oh, Cicero, I have seen tempests when the scolding winds did bribe the naughty oaks. And I have seen the ambitious ocean swell and rage and foam to be exalted with the heavens, but never until tonight, never till now have I seen a tempest dropping fire. Either there is civil strife in heaven or else the earth too saucy with the gods and senses them to send its destruction. What, saw you something even more wonderful? A common slave, you know him well by sight, held up his left hand, which did flame and burn like a thousand torches joined. And yet his hand, not sensible of the fire, remained unscorched. Besides, I had not since put up my sword against the capital. I met a lion, who glared at me and went surly by without annoying me. Upon a heap were drawn a hundred Ghastly women, transformed by their fear, who all claim they saw men, all in fire, walking up and down the streets. And yesterday, the bird of night did sit even at noonday upon the marketplace. When these prodigies so conjointly meet, let men not say, these are their reasons, and they are natural. For I do believe they are portentous things, under the climate of the time. Indeed, it is a strange, disposed time, yet men are apt to construe things after their fashion, clean apart from the purpose of the things themselves. Come, Caesar, to the capital tomorrow. He doth, for he did bid Antonius send word to you he would be there tomorrow. Then good night, Pastor. This disturbed sky is not to walk in. Farewell, Cicero. Who's there? A Roman. Casca, by your voice. Your ear is good. Cassius, what a night a is this. A very pleasing night to honest men. <laughs> Whoever knew the heavens did menace so. Those who have known the earth so full of faults. For my own part, I have walked about the street, submitting me unto this perilous night. And there, unbraced Casca, as you see, did I bear my bosom to the thunderstone. And when the cross blue lightning seemed to open, the breast of heaven, I did present myself in the aim and very flash of it. But wherefore did you tempt so much the heavens? It is the part of men to fear and tremble when the mighty gods, by these tokens, send such dreadful heralds to astonish us. Consider the true cause. Why all these fires? Why all these gliding ghosts? Why birds and beasts of quality and time? Why old men, fools, and children calculate? Why all these things change of their ordinance, their nature and perform faculties to monstrous quality? You will find heaven hath infused them with these spirits to make them instruments of fear and warning unto a monstrous state. Now could I name to be a man, Casca, most like this dreadful night that 
thunders, lightens, opens graves, and roars us off a lion in the capital, a man no mightier than thyself or me. Tis Caesar that you speak of, is it not, Cassius? Let it be who it is. For Romans have thews and limbs like their ancestors. Though the while our fathers' minds are dead, and we are governed by our mother's spirits, our yoke and sufferance have shown us womanish. Indeed, they say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar their king. And he shall wear the crown by sea and land in every province, save here in Italy. I know while I be wearing my dagger then. And if I know this, know all the world besides, that part of tyranny I do bear, I can shake off with pleasure. So can I. So any bondman in his own hand bears the power to cancel his own captivity. Then why should Caesar be a tyrant then? For I know he would not be a wolf. He thinks Romans are but sheep. What trash is Rome? What rubbish in a family that serves the base matter to illuminate so vile a thing as Caesar? Little grief, where hast thou led me? Perhaps I speak this to a willing bondman, then I know my answer must be made. But I am armed, and dangers are to me indifferent. You speak to Casca, and to such a man that is no fleer and telltale. Hold my hand, be factious for redress of these griefs, and I will set my foot as far as he who goes farthest. There's a bargain made. Now know you, Casca, I have moved already some of the noblest minded Romans to undergo free and enterprise, honorable and dangerous consequences. And I know they stay by me upon this porch. For this terrible night, there is no walking about the streets. The complexion of the element and the favors we have at hand, most bloody fire and most terrible. Stand close a while, here comes one in haste. Tis Sinna, I do know him by escape. He is a friend. Sinna, where haste you so? To find out you. Who's this, Metellus Simba? No, this is Casco, one in corporate for our attempts. Am I not safe for it, Simba? I'm glad on it. What a fearful night this is. There's two or three of us that seem strange sights. Am I not safe for it? Tell me. Yes, you are. Oh, Cassius, if you could but win the noble Brutus to our party. Be you content, good sir. Look, you take this paper and lay it in the fridge <coughs> here where Brutus can find it. Throw it in at his window, set it up upon a statue with wax where Brutus can find it. That done, repair upon his port we shall find us. Is Decius Brutus and Trebonius there? All but Metellus Simber. He's gone to find you at your house. Well, I will hide, and so bestow these papers as thou bade me. That done, repair to Pompey's theater. Come, Casca, you and I will get air to see Brutus at his house. Three parts of him is ours already, and the whole man upon the next encounter yields him ours. Oh, he stands high in all the people's hearts, and that which would appear offense in us. His countenance, like richest alchemy, transforms to virtue into worthiness. His worth and our great need of him, you are right well conceited. Let us go. It is midnight and air day. We will awake him and be sure of him. What ho, Lucius? I cannot by the progress of the stars give guess how near today. Lucius, I say! I would it were my fault to sleep so soundly. When, Lucius, when? Awake, I say! But, Lucius! Call you, my lord. Uh, get me a taper in my study, Lucius. When it is lighted, come and call me here. I will, my lord. It must be by his death. For my own part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him. But for the general, he would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder, and that craves weary walking. But crown him, that. And then I grant, we put a sting in him, that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affections swayed more than his reason, but tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face. But when he once attains the utmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looks to the clouds, scorning, the base degrees by which he did ascend. So Caesar may, then lest he may prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is, fashion it thus, that what he is 
augmented, would run to these and these extremities, <coughs> and therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would, like his kind, grow mischievous, and kill him in the shell. Paper burneth in your closet, sir. Searching the window for a flint, I found this paper thus sealed up, and I'm sure it did not lie there when I went to bed. Get thee to bed again, it is not day. Oh, it's not tomorrow, the Ides of March. I know not, sir. Look in the calendar and bring me word. I will, sir. Brutus, thou sleepst. Awake and see thyself. Shall roll, etc. Speak, strike, express. Brutus, thou sleepst, awake. Such instigations have often been dropped where I've took them up. Shall roam, etc. Thus must I piece it out. Shall roam, stand under one man's awe. What, Rome? My ancestors did from the streets of Rome the Tarquin drive when he was called a king. Speak, strike. Address. Am I entreated to speak and strike? O oh, Rome, I make thee promise, if the redress will follow, thou receives thy full petition at the hand of Brutus. Sir, March is wasted fifteen days. Tis good. Oh, go to the gate, someone not. Since Cassius first did, wet me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motions, all the interim is like a phantasma or a hideous dream. <coughs> the genius and his mortal instruments are then in council in the state of man, like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection. Sir, tis your sister Cassius at the door who doth desire to see you. Is she alone? No, sir, there are more with her. You know them? No, sir, their hats are plucked about their ears and have their faces buried in their cloaks that by no means I may discover them by any mark of favor. Let them enter. They are the faction. Conspiracy, shames thou to show thy dangerous brow by night when evils are most free. Oh, well, then by day, where wilt thou find a cavern dark enough to mask thy monster's visage? Seek none conspiracy. Hide it in smiles and affability. For if thou path thy native semblance on, not Erebus itself wrote them enough to hide thee from prevention. I do think we are too bold upon your rest. Good morrow, Brutus. Do we trouble you? I am up this hour, awake all night. And nor are these men that come along with you. Aye, every man of them and every man here honors you and wishes you held the same opinion of yourself that every noble Roman bears. This is Tremonius. Oh, he is welcome hither. This DC is Brutus. She is welcome too. This Casca, this Senna, and this Metellus symbol. They are all welcome. What watchful cares would interpose themselves betwixt your eyes and night? Shall I entreat a word? Here lies the east. Doth not the day break here? No. Well, pardon, sir, it doth. And yon gray lines that fret the clouds are messengers of day. You shall confess that you are both deceived. Here, as I point my sword, the sun arises, which is a great way growing upon the south, waiting in the youthful season of the year. Some two months hence, up higher to the north, he first shows his fire, and the high east stands as the capital directly here. And give me your hands all over, one by one. And let us swear our resolution. No. Not an oath if not the faces of men, the sufferance of our souls, the times abuse. If these be motives weak, break off betimes and each man hence to his idle bed. So let high-sided tyranny rain on till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I am sure they do, 
bear fire enough to kindle cowards and steal with valor the melting spirits of women. And countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoken the word and will not palter? What other oath than honesty to honesty engaged that this shall be or we will fall for it? I swear priests and cowards and men cautelous old feeble carrions and such suffering souls that welcome wrongs. Unto bad causes swear such creatures as men doubt, but do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise, nor the insuppressed metal of our spirits. And to think that, or our cause, or our performance did need an oath, when every drop of blood that every Roman bears, and nobly bears, is guilty of a several bastardy if you do break the smallest particle of any promise that has passed from him. But what of Cicero? Shall we sound him? I did think he will stand very strong with us. Let us not leave him out. No, by no means. Oh, let us have him. For his silver hair for purchase a good opinion. And by men's voice to commend our deeds. It shall be said his judgment ruled our hands. Our youths and wives now would appear, but all be buried in his gravity. Oh. Name him not. Uh, let us not break with him, for he will never follow anything that other men begin. Then leave him out. Indeed, he is not fit. Shall no man else be touched but only Caesar? Decius well urged. I think it not meet that Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. You will find him to be a shrewd contriver, and you know his means. If he should improve them, they could stretch as far as to annoy us all. Which, to prevent, let Antony and Caesar fall together. Uh, our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius. To cut off the head and then hack the limbs? Like wrath in death and envy afterwards. For Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us be sacrifices, but not butchers, Cassius. We all stand against the spirit of Caesar. And in the spirit of men there is no blood. Oh, that we then could come by Caesar's spirit and not just member Caesar. But alas, Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, let's kill him boldly, but not wrathfully. Let's carve him as a dish fit for the gods, not hew him as a carcass fit for hounds. <clears throat> and let our hearts, as subtle masters do, stir their servants up to an act of rage. <clears throat> and after, seemed a child. This will make our purpose <clears throat> necessary and not envious, which, so appearing to the common eyes, we will be called Perjures, not murderers. As for Mark Antony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. But I fear him for the engrafted love he bears. Uh, alas, good Cassius, think not of him. If he do love Caesar, all that he can do is to himself take thought and die for Caesar. And that is much he should, for he is given to sports, to wildness, and much company. There is no fear in him. Let him not die. We will live and laugh at this hereafter. Oh, peace. Count the clock. The clock has stricken through. It is time to march. But we do not know whether Caesar will come today or no. For he is superstitious grown of late. Quite from the main opinion he held once of dreams of fantasies and ceremonies. It could be these apparent prodigies, the unaccustomed terror of this night, and the persuasion of an augurist could hold him from the capital today. Never fear that. If he be so resolved, I can persuade him. For he loves to hear that unicorns may be betrayed by trees, and bears with glasses, elephants with holes, lions with toils, and men with flatters. But when I tell him he hates flatters, he says he does, being then most flattered. Let me work, for I can give his humor the true bit, and I can bring him to the capital. Nay, all of us will be there to fetch him. By the eighth hour, is that the uttermost? Be that the uttermost, and fail not then. Caius Ligarius thought Barasius was hard, who right here was speaking of the Pompey. How long did you ever thought of Good Mertellus, go on by her. She loved me well, and I have given her reasons. Send her but hither, and I'll fashion her. Well, we will leave you, Brutus. Friends, disperse yourselves. Remember what you've said today, and show yourselves true Romans. Good friends. Look you fresh and merrily. Let not our looks put on our purposes, but bear it as our Roman actors do, with untired spirits and formal constancy. 
And so for Mark to everyone. Lucius! Lucius! Fast asleep. Tis no matter, enjoy the honey heavy dew of slumber. Thou hast no figures nor no fantasies which busy care draws in the brains of men. Therefore thou sleep'st so sound. Brutus, my lord. Portia, what mean you? Wherefore rise you now? It is not for your health thus to commit your weak condition to the raw cold morning. Nor for yours neither. Ye have ungently, Brutus, stole from my bed. And yesternight at supper you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across. And when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I urged you further, then you scratched your head and too impatiently stamped with your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you answered not, but with an angry waft of your hand gave sign for me to leave you. So I did, fearing to strengthen that impatience which seemed too much in Kindle, and with all hoping it was but an effect of humor, which sometime hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep, and could it work so much upon your shape as it had much prevailed on your condition? I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I, I am not well in health, Portia, and that is all. Brutus is wise, and were he not in health, he would embrace the means to come by it. What? So I do. Good Portia, go to bed. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck out the humors of the dank morning? What? Is Brutus sick? And will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night, tempt the ruby and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? Oh, my Brutus, you have some sick offense within your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. And upon my knees I charm you by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love, and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one, that you unfold to me yourself, your half, why you are heavy, and what men tonight have had resort to you. For here have been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from darkness. Kneel not, gentle Portia. I should not need if you were a gentle Brutus. Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted I should know no secrets appertaining to you? Am I yourself, but as it were, in sort or a limitation to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure, if it be no more, Portia as Brutus Harlot, not his wife. You are my true and honorable wife, as dear to me as other ruddy drops that visit my sad heart. If this were true, then should I know this secret? I grant I am a woman, but with all a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife, I grant I am a woman, but with all a woman well reputed Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex, being so fathered and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels. I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself a voluntary wound here in the thigh. And I bear that with patience and not my husband's secrets. Oh, ye gods, render me worthy of this noble wife. Oh, hark! One knock. Portia, go in a while. But by and by, thy bosom shall partake the secrets of my heart. All my engagements I will construe to thee, all the character of my sad brows. Leave me with haste. Lucius, who's that Knox? Here's a sick woman that would speak. Oh, Caius Agarius. Lucius, stand aside. Caius Agarius, how? Not safe, good morning, feeble tongue. Oh, what a time if you chose our brave Caius to wear a kerchief. Would you were not sick? I am not sick, if Brutus have in hand any exploit worthy the name of honor. Such an exploit have I in hand, Ligarius, had you a healthful ear to hear it. By all the gods the Romans bow before, soul of Rome, brave son derived from honorable loins. Thou, like an exorcist, hast conjured my mortified spirit. Now bid me run, and I will start the things impossible, yet get the better of them. What's to do? piece of work that will make sick men whole. But are not some men whole that we must make sick? That must we also. 
What it is, my class, I shall unfold to thee as we are going to whom it must be done. Well, so on your foot with the heart new fire, I'll follow you to do I know not what, but it suffices if the Brutus leads me on. Follow me then. Tonight, Thrice of Calpurnia cried out in her sleep, Help hold and murder Caesar. Uh, who's with him? My lord. Go bid the priest do present sacrifice and uh, bring me their opinions of success. I will, my lord. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir from your house this day. Caesar shall forth. The things that threaten me have never looked but upon my back. And they shall see the face of Caesar. They're vanished. Caesar, I have never stood on ceremony, yet now they fight me. There is one within, besides the things which we have heard and seen, recounts the most horrid sights as seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets. Graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds and ranks and squadrons and right form of war, which drizzled blood upon the capital. The sound of battle hurled upon the air. Horses did neigh, and dying men did groan, and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the street. O oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all use, and I do fear them. What can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are the world in general as to Caesar. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves place forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never tastes of death but once. Of all the wonders I yet have heard, it seems to be most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. Ah, what say the armorers? They will not have you start forth today, my lord. Plug in your entrails they're offering forth. They cannot find a heart for the beast. The gods do this in shame of cowardice. Caesar should be a beast without a heart if he were to stay at home today for fear. No, Caesar shall not. For danger knows full well Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are two lions littered in one day, and I, the elder, more terrible, and Caesar shall go forth. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not move forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We'll send Mark Antony to the Senate house, and he shall say that you are not well today. Let me, upon my knee, prevail in this. Mark Anthony shall say I am not well, and for thy humor, I will stay at home. And here's Decius Brutus. She shall tell them so. Caesar, I'll hail. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate house. And you are come in very happy time to bear my greeting to the senators and tell them, I will not come today, and I is false, that I dare not falser, I will not come. Tell them so, Decius. Say he is sick. <laughs> now shall Caesar send a lie? Have I stretched my arm of conquest so far to be afraid to tell graybeards the truth? Decius, go tell them Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. The cause is in my will. I will not come. That is enough to satisfy the Senate. But for your private satisfaction, because I love you, I will let you know. Calpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. Tonight she dreamt she saw my statue, which like a fountain with a hundred spouts, did run pure blood. And many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. And these does she apply for warnings, importance, and evils imminent, and on her knee if begged that I will stay at home today. This dream is all a misinterpreted. It was a vision, fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in many pipes, in which so many smiling Romans vain, signifies that from you a great Rome shall suck reviving blood, and that great men shall press 
for tinctures, stones, relics, and cognizance. This spite Calpurnia surely signified. <laughs> Miss Wade, you well expounded it. <laughs> I have, when you have heard what I can say. And know it now. The Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word you will not come, their minds may change. Besides, it were a mock act to be rendered for someone to say, break up the Senate till another time, when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper, lo, Caesar is afraid? Pardon me, Caesar, for my dear, dear love to your proceeding bids me tell you this, and reason to my love is liable. How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia. I'm ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. And look, poor Publius has come to fetch me. Good morrow, Caesar. Welcome, Publius. What, Brutus? Are you stirred so early, too? Poor old Casca. Caius Ligarius, Caesar was ne'er so much your enemy as that same og which has made you lean. Uh, what is the clock? Oh, uh, Caesar, uh, it just struck at eight. I thank you for your pains and courtesies. Ah, see, Antony, <coughs> who revels long at nights, is notwithstanding, uh, up. Moral, Antony. So to the noble Caesar. <laughs> uh, bid them prepare within. I'm to blame to be thus waited for. Ah, Now, Metellus, what Trebonius? I have an hour's talk in store for you. Remember that you call on me today. Be near me that I may remember you. Caesar, I will. Is that near will I be? It's best friends which I can further. Good friends, go in and taste some wine with me, and we, like friends, will straightway go together. Like is not the same, O Caesar. The heart of Brutus yearns to think of him. Yet, 
Now what should I do? Run to the capital and nothing else, and so return to you and nothing else? Yes. And bring me word, if thy lord look well, for he went safely forth. And take good note, what Caesar doth, what suitors press to him. Hark. What noise was that? I hear none. I heard a vastly rumor like a fray, and the wind brings it from the capital. Soothe, madam, I hear nothing. Uh, come hither. Which way hast thou been? At mine own house, good lady. Oh, what is the clock? About the ninth hour, lady. Is Caesar yet gone to the capital? Madam, not yet. I go to take my stand to see him pass on to the capital. Oh, thou hast some suit to Caesar, hast thou not? None that I know will be, much that I fear may chance. Good morrow to you. Here the street is narrow, the throng that follows Caesar at the heels of senators, of traitors, common suitors, will crowd a feeble woman almost to death. I'll get me to a place more void, and there speak to great Caesar as he comes along. I must go in. Mind me, how weak a thing the heart of woman is. Oh, Brutus, the heavens speed thee in thine enterprise. Sure, she heard me. A Brutus hath a suit that Caesar will not grant. Run, Lucius, commend me to my lord. Say, I am Mary. Come to me again and bring me word what he doth say to thee. Aye, Caesar, but not gone. Hail, Caesar! Read this schedule! Trebonius just desire you to all read at your best leisure. This is humble suit. Caesar, read mine first, for mine is a suit that touches the mirror. Read it, my Caesar! What touches us ourselves should be last, sir. Do not delay, Caesar. Read it instantly. Is a fellow mad? Sir Rod, good place. What's urging your petitions in the streets? Come to the capital. I wish your enterprise to stand and cry. What enterprise, Pagillus? Very well. What's that, Pagillus? Well, she wished to hear her enterprise may thrive, but I do think her purpose is discovered. Look how she makes to Caesar. Mark her. Cast up a sudden, for we fear prevention. For what shall be done if this be known? Cast Caesar since I shall never turn back, for I will slay myself. Cast his be constant. Billy Slater speaks not of our purposes. For look, she smiles and Caesar doth not change. Traponius knows his time. For look, you Brutus, he draws my reins in the out of the way. Where is Metellus Simber? Let him go and presently prefer his suit to Caesar. He is addressed. Press near and second him. Cast it. I read the first thing. Are we all ready? What is now amiss that Caesar and his Senate must address? Most high, most mighty, most puissant Caesar, I am Matilda Simber, throws upon that seat and humble heart. I must prevent thee, Simber. These couchings and lowly courtesies might fire the blood of ordinary men and turn preordinance and first decree into the laws of <coughs> children. Be not fond to think that Caesar bears such rebel blood and will be thawed from the true quality by that which melteth fools. I mean, sweet words, low crook courtesies, and base spaniel fawnings. Thy brother, by decree, is banished, and if thou dost bend and pray and fawn for him, I spurn thee like a cur out of my way. No, Caesar doth not wrong, nor without cause will he be satisfied. But Caesar, is there no voice worthy than my own to sound so sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repelling of my banished brother? I would kiss thy hand, Caesar, but not in flattery, desiring thee that Publius Simmer may have an immediate break of repeal. Pardon, Caesar, Caesar, pardon as long as thy foot doth cast these fall to bay, enfranchisement for Publius Simmer. <coughs> I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, then prayers would move me. But I am constant as a northern star, of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. The skies are painted with unnumbered sparks. They're all fire and every one does shine, but there's but one in all doth hold his place. So in the world, tis well furnished with men, and men are flesh and blood, and apprehensive. Yet of their number, I do know but one that doth unassailable hold on his rank, unshaped of motion, and that I am he, let me a little show it, even in this, 
I was constant Simmer should be banished, and constant do remain to keep him so. Speak pants for me! Oh. 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 Two, Brute. Oh. 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 Then fall. Caesar. Liberty! Freedom! Tyranny is dead! Run heads! Proclaim! Cry him on the street! Come to the time of moments! Cry out! Liberty! Freedom! And infrastructure! All the senators! Be on the present! Blood right! Stay still! Ambition's debt is paid! Go to the pulpit, Brutus! And Cassius, too! Where's Publius? Here, fight and find with this mutiny. We stand back together! Talk not free. standing! Publius, good cheer! There was no harm intended to your person, nor to no Roman else! So tell them, Publius! Leave us, Publius, lest the people rushing on us should do your aid submit to Do so, and let no man by this day but read the doors! Swear to Antony! Put to his house in maze, and then wives and children run, stare and crowd, as if it were doomed there. Oh, fates, we will know your pleasures! That we must die, we know. Tis but the time and drawing days out that men stand upon. He that cuts off twenty years of life cuts off twenty years of fearing death. Grant that. And then is death a benefit. So are we, Caesar's friends, that have thus abridged his time of fearing death. Stoop. Stoop. Let us bathe our hands in Caesar's blood up to the elbows. Let us besmear our swords and go we forth even to the marketplace. And waving our red weapons o'er our heads, let's all cry peace, freedom, and liberty. How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over? In states unborn and access yet unknown. How many times shall Caesar bleed in sport that now on Pompey's face this lies along, no worthier than the dust. So oft as this shall be, so often will the night of us be called the men who gave their country liberty. What? Shall we pour? Aye, every man away. We will grace his heels with all the best hearts of Rome. Oh, but soft, who comes here? A friend of Antony's. Thus, Brutus, did my master bid me kneel. Thus, did Mark Antony bid me to fall down and be prostrate. Thus, he bade me say, Brutus is kind, noble, valiant, and honest. Caesar was mighty, bold, royal, and loving. Say, I love Brutus and honor him. Say, I feared Caesar, honored him, and loved him. If Brutus can vouchsafe that Mark Antony may safely come to him and be resolved how Caesar hath preserved life in death, then Mark Antony shall no longer love Caesar dead as well as Brutus living, but will follow the affairs and fortunes of noble Brutus throughout the hazards of this undrawn state. With all true faith, so saith my master, Mark Antony. Thy master is a wise and valiant Roman. I never thought him worse. So tell him, please him come to this place, he will be satisfied, and by mine honor, depart untouched. I'll fetch him presently. I know we shall have him well to friends. Do wish we may begin to have a mind still that fears him much, and I must give us more truly to the purpose. Well, but here comes Antony. Welcome, Mark Antony. Oh, oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glorious triumphs, spoiled, shrunk to this little measure? Very well. I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. Who else must be let blood? Who else is rank? If I myself, there is no hour so fit as Caesar's death hour. No, no instruments have had that work as those your swords, made rich with the most noble blood of all this world. Live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die. No place will please me so, no mean of death as here by Caesar, and by you cut off the chosen master spirits of this age! Antony, beg not your death of us, though now we must appear bloody and cruel, as by our hands, and this our present act you see we do. 
And see you but our hands, and this is the bleeding business they have done. Our hearts you see not. They are pitiful. And pity to the general wrong of Rome. As fire drives out fire, so pity, pity hath done this deed on Caesar. For your part, to you our swords have leaden points, Mark Antony. Our arms in strength of malice. And our hearts of brother's temper do receive you in with all kind love, good thoughts, and reverence. Your voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of your dignity. Only be patient till we have appeased the multitude beside themselves with fear. Then we will deliver you the cause why I that did love Caesar when I struck him and thus proceeded. I doubt not of your wisdom, but each one render me his bloody hand. First, Marcus Brutus, do I shake with you? Next, Caius Cassius, do I take your hand? Metellus, yours. Gentlemen all, alas, I know not what to say. I fear my credit lies on such slippery ground that you must conceit me one of two bad ways, either a coward or a flatterer. That I love thee, Caesar. Oh, it is true. If then thy spirit look upon us now, will it not grieve thee dearer than thy death to see thy Antony making his peace, shaking the bloody fingers of these foes most noble in the presence of thy corpse? Here, who thou bade, brave heart? Here, didst thou fall, and here stand thy hunters, sighed in thy spoil, and crimsoned in thy leaf? How like a deer, struck in by many princes, dost thou here lie? Pardon me, Caius Cassius. The enemies of Caesar shall say this, then in a friend it is called modesty. I blame you not for praising Caesar so, but what compact mean you to have with us? Shall you be pricked in number of our friends, or shall we on and not depend on you? Therefore I took your hands, but was swayed from the point when looking on Caesar. Friends, I am with you all, and love you all upon this hope. You shall give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Who else with this a savage spectacle? Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. Yes, oh, I seek. And I am, moreover, suitor that I may produce his body to the marketplace. And in the pulpit, as becomes a friend, speak in the order of his funeral. <coughs> you shall. Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Mark Antony speak at the funeral. Would you not know how the people may be moved by that which he will utter? By your pardon, I will myself into the pulpit first and show the reasons of our Caesar's death. When Antony shall speak, I will protest he speaks by leave and by permission, and that we are contented that Caesar shall have all true rites and lawful ceremonies. And to advantage more than to us for all. I know not what may fall. I like it not. Jeez. Mark Antony, here, take your Caesar's body. Now, you shall not, in your funeral speech, blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar. And say you do it by our permission, else shall you not have any hand at all about his funeral. And you shall speak in the same pulpit whereto I am going after my speech is ended. Be it so, I, I do desire no more. The body then and follow us. <laughs> Pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. my tongue. Blood and destruction shall cumber all the parts of Italy that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants killed <coughs> by the hands of war. And Caesar's spirit, ranging for revenge, 
with Latte by his side, shall in these confines speak with a monarch's voice, cry havoc, and let slip the gods of war! That this foul deed shall smell upon the earth with carrion men, groaning for burial! You, sir, Octavius Caesar, do you not? I, I do, Mark Antony. And Caesar wrote for him to come to Rome. He did receive his letters and his coming, and bids me say to you by word of mouth. Give me a heart, thy heart is big. Passion I see is catching forth. Seeing those beads of sorrow in thy mind begin to water. Is that master coming? He lies tonight at seven leagues of Rome. Goes back with speed and tell him what hath chanced. Here is a morning Rome, a dangerous Rome. No Rome of safety for Octavius yet. Hide hence and tell him so. Yet! Stay a while. Thou shalt not back till I have borne his flesh <coughs> to the marketplace. There shall I try in moderation how the people take the cruel issue of these bloody men. You shall discourse the young Octavius. Lend me thy hand. Caesar were dead to live all free men. As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. <coughs> there was tears for his love. Joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Oh, who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any, speak. For him, I have offended. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any, speak for him I have offended. And who is here so <coughs> vile that would not love his country? If any, speak for him I have offended. I pause for a reply. No, 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 no. Have I offended? I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. The question of his death is enrolled in the capital. His glories not extenuated wherein he was worthy, nor his offenses enforced for which he suffered death. <coughs> Here comes the morning, Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand at all in Caesar's death, shall receive the benefit of his dying. A place in the commonwealth is which of you shall not. With this I depart, that as I slew, my best lover, for the good of Rome, I hold the same dagger for myself, when it shall please my country to need my death. Bring him a triumph into his house. Let him be Caesar. Uh, good countrymen. Be silent, Brutus. Good face. countrymen, let me depart alone. And for my sake, stay here with Antony. 
to grace to Caesar's corpse, and grace his speech, tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make, I, I do entreat you. Not a man depart, save I alone, till Antony have spoke. That fellow him and let us hear Mark Antony. Let him go into the public chair. We'll hear him. Now, will Antony go up? For Brutus is saying, I'm not hoping to. What does he say of Brutus? He says for Brutus to say. For best he speak no harm of Brutus. Let the book have written on Friends, Romans, countrymen, and near ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often terrid with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. <coughs> the noble Brutus hath told you he was ambitious. If it were so, it's a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, on the leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious. I, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransom did the general coffers still did this in Caesar's name ambitious. When the poor hath cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Brutus says he was ambitious, and he is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal, thrice I presented him a kingly crown, which thrice he did refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure he is an honorable man. I come to speak. Not to disprove what Brutus spoke. I speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause then withhold you to mourn for him? He thinks there's much reason in his sayings. This is true, but Caesar was done very wrong. Has he, masters? I fear there will the worst come in his place. Mark Cheese words. We do not take the crown. Therefore, to it serve is not ambitious. It's the mounds of some will be or my soul. It's as red as fire. There's not a nobler man in Rome than ain't. Now, Mark him. He begins to speak. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong. But I choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you. Here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. <laughs> Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds. We'll hear the will. Read it to Mark Antony. Have it. patience, I must not read it. It is not me that you should know how Caesar loved you. You're not stones, but men. And being men, beholding the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. Tis good you know not. You are his heirs. Would you show what good would come of it? Read the will. You shall read us the will. Caesar's will. Read the will. Don't be patient. Will you stay alive? I will shot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the men who staggered have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. They were traitors, honorable men. Read the will. The will. The will. The will. The will. You will help me then read the will. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. 
I remember the first time ever I saw him put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent. That day he overcame the Nervii. Look, in this place ran Cassius's dagger through. <coughs> See what a rent the envious Casca made! The well beloved Brutus stabbed! And as he plucked his cussed skill away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it to be resolved, and Brutus had so unkindly not to know. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindness cutting of all. For when he saw him stab, in gratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him and burst his mighty heart. Oh, no, we'll see, sir! Oh, that's yeah. a yeah. Yeah. Oh, Stay back! Stay back! Stay back! Stay back! Stay back! Stay back! Stay Gentle friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you with such a flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not that they did it. But as you all know, a plain, blunt man who loved his friend, and that they know full well they gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on, and tell you that which you yourselves do know. <coughs> Show you sweet Caesar's wounds. Pour dumb mouths and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and he Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every one of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny! <laughs> citizen he gives to every several man 75 drachmas. Oh, oh, Hear me with gracious! Moreover, he has left you his walks, his private arbors, his new planted orchards on this side tiger. He has left him you and your heirs forever common pleasures. To be walkable and to recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. When comes such another! Caesar's house. I will thither straight and visit him. It comes upon a wish and fortunes marry. And in this mood, he'll give us anything. I heard him say Brutus and Cassius are rid like madmen through the gates of Rome. Be like they had some notice of the people, how I have moved them. <laughs> you take me to Octavius. <laughs> Caesar's funeral. As a friend, as an 
enemy. As a friend. That is answered directly. For your dwelling. Briefly. Briefly. I go by the capital. And your name, sir, truly? Truly, my name is Senna. <laughs> These many then shall die, the names are pricked. <clears throat> you know your brother too shall die. Consent, you Lepidus? I do consent. Put him down, Antony. Upon the condition people should not live. Who is your sister's son, Antony? He shall not live. Look, with a spot I damn him. But let us go you to Caesar's house and fetch the will hither. We shall determine how to cut off some charge and legacies. What? Shall I find you here? Or here or at the capital? <laughs> this is a slight unmerciful man, meet to be sent on the errands. Is it fit the threefold world divided? He should be one of the three to share it. <coughs> so thought you and took his voice on we should be pricked to die in our black sentence and prescription. Octavius, I've seen more days than you. Though we lay these honors on this man to ease ourselves of divers, slanderous loads, he shall but grab them as the ass bears gold, <laughs> to grind and sweat under the business, either led or dreaded as we point the way, and having brought us our treasure, take we down his load, and turn him off like to the empty ass to shake his ears and graze in commons. You may do what you will, but he's a tried and valiant soldier. <coughs> So's my horse, Octavius. Ooh. And for that, I do appoint him store for vendor. It is a creature that <coughs> I would teach to fight, to, to run, to stop, to <coughs> run directly on. It's corporal motion governed by my spirit. And in some cases, it's left us but so. He should be taught and trained and bid go forth. And so must we, who we are at the stake and bait about by many enemies, some who smile, who have in their hearts, I fear, millions of mischiefs. <clears throat> what ho, Lucilius? Is Cassius near? Theirs has come to do you salutation from his master. He greets me well. Your master, Pindarus, in her own change or by ill officers, hath given me some worthy cause to wish things done undone. But if she be at hand, I shall be satisfied. I do not doubt that she shall appear, such as she is, full regard and honor. She is not doubted. A word with you, Lucilius. How she received you, let me be resolved. Uh, with courtesy and respect enough, but not with such familiar instances, nor with the free and friendly conferences she hath of old. Thou hast described a hot friend cooling. Ever know, Lucilius, when love begins to sicken and decay, it useth an enforced ceremony. There are no tricks in plain and simple faith, but hollow men, like horses hot at hand, make gallant show and promise of their mettle. But when they should endure the body's spur, they fall their crests and like deceitful jades sink in the trial. Comes her army on. They mean this night the songs to be quartered, and made the fog. The horse in general come with castles. Oh, hark, she's arrived. Most noble brother, you have done me wrong. Touch me, you gods. Wrong I, mine enemies. And if not so, how should I then wrong my sister? Where is this sober form of yours hides wrongs and wickedness? Cassius, be content. Speak your grief soft. I do know you well. Before the eyes of both our armies here, which should perceive nothing but love from us, let us not wrangle. Bid them move away, and then in my tent, Cassius, in larger griefs, and I will give you audience. And then Doris, put out the bandages that are charges off a little from this ground. Lucilius, do you the like, and let no man come to our tent till our conference is ended. Let Lucius and Titinius guard our door. You have wronged me, doth appear in this. You condemned and noted Lucius Pella, taking bribes to the Sardines, wearing my letters, praying on his side, because I knew the man was slighted off. You wronged yourself to write in such a 
Okay. At such a time as this, it is not meet that every nice event should bear his comment. Let me tell you, Cassius, you are much condemned to have an itching palm to sell and mark your offices for gold to undeservers. I, an itching palm? You know you are Brutus that speaks this realm's by the gods when the speaker laughs. The name of Cassius honors this corruption and chastisement, does therefore honor. Chastisement? Remember, March! The eyes of March, remember. Did not great Julius breed for justice sake? What villain touched his body that did stab and not for justice? What? Shall one of us who struck the foremost man of all this world but for supporting robbers? Shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes and sell the mighty spaces of our large honors for so much trash that may be grasped thus? I had rather be a dog and be the moon than such a Roman. Oh, ye gods, ye gods, must I endure all this? By all this more, fret till your proud heart break. Go and show your slaves how choleric you are and make your bondmen tremble. Must I budge? Must I observe you? Must I stand and crouch under your testy humor? By the gods, you shall digest the venom of your spleen, though it do split you. For from this day forth, I'll use you for my mirth. Hit for my laughter when you are washed, but if it come to this, do not presume too much upon my love, for I may do that shall be sorry. You have done that you should be sorry for. There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am so armed in honesty that they pass me by as the idle wind which I respect not. I sent to you for certain sums of money which you denied me. For I can raise no money by vile means. By heaven. I had rather coin my heart and drop my blood for drachmas and wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile trash by any indirection. I sent to you for gold to pay my allegiance, which you denied me! Was that done like Cassius? Should I have answered Cassius so? When Marcus Brutus grows so covetous as to lock such rascal counters from his friends, be ready, gods, with all your thunderbolt dash of the pieces. I denied you not. You did. I did not. It was but a fool that brought my answer back. Brutus hath bribed my heart. A friend should bear his friend's affirmative, but Brutus makes my greater than they are. I do not till you practice them on me. If you love me not, I do not like your faults. A friendly eye could not see such faults. A flatterer's could not. Though they do appear as huge as high Olympus. Oh, come, Mark Antony and young Octavius, come. Revenge yourselves. Oh, long on Cassius. For Cassius is the weary of the world. Hated by the one she loves. Brave by her brother. Take my dagger and strike it thou this against Caesar. For I know when thou hatest him worse, thou lovest him better than thou ever loves Cassius. She, your dagger. Be angry when you will, it will have scope. Do what you will. Dishonor will be humor. <coughs> oh, Cassius, you are yoked with a lamb who carries anger as the flint bears fire, which, much enforced, shows a hasty spark and straight as cold again. And Cassius lived to be but mirth and laughter to her Brutus, when grief and blood tempered vexeth him. When I spoke that I was ill-tempered, too. Do you confess so much? Give me your hand. It's my heart, <coughs> Brutus. Oh, what's the matter? Have you not loved enough to bear with me when... That rash humor which my mother gave me makes me forgetful. Yes, Cassius. And from henceforth, whenever you are over earnest with your Brutus, he'll think your mother chides and leave you so. I did not think you could have been so angry. Oh, Cassius. I am sick of many griefs. Of your philosophies, you make no use if you give place to accidental evils. No one bears sorrow better. Portia is dead. Portia! She is dead. I'll escape thy killing when I cross thee so. Oh, insupportable and touching loss! Upon what sickness? Impatient of my absence, and for fear that Octavius and Mark Antony have made themselves so strong, for with her death that tidings came, she fell distract, and her attendants absent, Swallowed fire. And died so? Even so. Oh, ye mortal god! I speak no more for I pray. Come in, Titanius! Oh, welcome, Masala. Masala, I have received letters that Octavius and Mark Antony come down upon us with a mighty power, bending their expedition toward Philippi. Myself have letters of the self-same tenor. With what addition? 
that by proscriptions and bills of outlawry, Octavius, Anthony, and Lepidus have put to death and under the senators. Therein our letters do not well agree. Mine speak of seventy senators that died by their prescriptions, Cicero being one. Cicero one. Cicero is dead, and that by order of proscription. Have you any letters of your wife, my lord? No, Masala. Nor nothing in your letters rid of her? Nothing, Masala. That methinks is strange. Why well, ask you? Here you are of her and yours. No, my lord. No, as you are a Roman, tell me true. And like a Roman, bear the truth I tell. For certain she is dead, and that by strange manner. Aye. Farewell, Portia. We must die, Masala. By meditating that she must die once, I have the patience to endure it now. Even so, great men, great losses will endure. I have as much ardentness as you, but yet my nature could not bear it so. Well, to our work alive, what do you think of marching to Philippi presently? I do not think it could. Your reason? This is it. Tis better that the enemy seek out us, waste his means, weary his soldiers, doing himself offense, while we find still a full of rest, defense, and nimbleness. Good reasons must of course give place to better. The people to Philippi at this grounds do stand but in a forced affection. For they have grudged us contribution. Now the enemy, marching along by them, by them shall make a fuller number up and come on refreshed, new added and encouraged. From which advantage shall we cut him off? If at Philippi we do place him there, these people at our backs. Hear me, good I'll do your pardon. You must know besides. We have tried the utmost of our friends. Our legions are brimful, our cause is right. The enemy increaseth every day. We, at the height, are ready to decline. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyages of their life are bound in shallows and in misery. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves, or we'll lose our ventures. Then by your will go on, go we'll along and meet them at Philippi. Uh, the deep of night has crept upon our talk, and nature must obey necessity, which we will obey with a little rest. There is no more to say. No more, good night. Early tomorrow we shall rise. Oh, dear brother, this was an ill beginning of the night. Never let such, di such division come between our souls. Everything is well. Good night, my lord. Good night. shapes this monstrous apparition. It comes before me. Art thou anything? Art thou some god, some angel, or some devil that makes my blood cold and my hair to stare? Speak to me what thou art! Proves not so, their battles are at hand. They mean to warn us here at Philippi. Answer before we do demand of them. Tut, I am in their bosoms. I know wherefore they do it. They could con be content to visit other places, or come down with fearful bravery and fasten by this face that they have courage, but tis not so. Prepare you, generals. The enemy comes on in gallant show. The bloody sign of battle is hung out and something to be done immediately. Octavius. Lead your battle on upon the left hand of the even field. Upon the right hand I, keep thou the left. Why do you cross me in this exigent? I do not cross you, but I will do so. Mark Antony, shall we give sign of battle? No, Caesar. We will answer on their charge. Mark forth. The generals would have some words. Stir not until the signal. Words before blows. Is it so, countrymen? Not that we love words better as you do. 
Good words are better than bad strokes, Octavius. In your bad strokes, Brutus, you give good words. Mark the hole that you made in Caesar's heart, crying, Long live! Hail Caesar! Antony, the posture of your blows is yet unknown. But for your words, they rob the high blabees and leave them honeyless. Not stingless, too. Oh, yes, and soundless, too, for you have stolen their buzzing, Antony, and very wisely threat before you sting. Villains you did not sow when your cursed daggers hacked into the sides of Caesar. You showed your teeth like apes and fawned like hounds and bowed like bondmen at the feet of Caesar while stabbing Casca stabbed Caesar from behind. Oh, you flatterers! Come, come, the cause. If arguing makes us sweat, the proof of it will turn to redder drops. I draw my sword against the conspirators. When will I put up this sword again? Never until the 33 and 30 wounds of Caesar have been well avenged, or until a new Caesar has added slaughter to the swords of traitors. Caesar, thou canst not die by traitors' hands, unless thou brings them with thee. So I hope I was not born to die on Brutus' sword. Oh, if thou wert the noblest of thy strain, good sir, thou couldst not die more honorable. A peevish schoolboy, worthless of such honor, joined with a masker and a reveler. Oh, Cassius, still? Come, Antony, away. Defiance, traitors, hurl in your teeth. If you dare to fight today, come to the field. If not, when you have the stomach. Masala, this is my birthday. As this very day was Cassius born, give me thy hand, Masala, and be thou my witness that against my will as Pompey was, I am compelled to set upon one battle all our liberties. There shall have seen, like a canopy most fatal, under which our army lies, ready to give up the ghost. Believe not so. But believe it partly, for I am push of spirit and resolve to meet all perils very constantly. Even so, Lucilius. Now, most noble Brutus, the gods today stand friendly that we may, lovers in peace, lead on our days to aid. Since the affairs of men still rest uncertain, let us reason with the worst that may befall. If we lose this battle, then is this the last time we will speak together? What then are you determined to do? Even by the rule of that philosophy by which I did blame Cato for the debt which he did give himself, I know not how, but I find it cowardly and vile, for fear of what might fall so to end the time of life. Arming myself with patience to stay the providence of some high powers and help us below. Then if we lose this battle, your contingent will end strive throughout the streets of Rome. No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus shall go bound to Rome. He bears too great a mind. But this same day must end the work the eyes of March begun. And whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, why we shall smile. If not, why then this parting was well made. Forever and ever farewell, Brutus. If we do meet again, well, we shall smile indeed. And if not, tis true this parting was well made. <clears throat> I will lead on. Oh, that a man might know the end of this day's business ere it come. It suffice that the day will end, and then the end is known. Come, away! Right. Ride, Miss Alton, ride, and give these bills up to the legion on the other side. No. Let them set on at once, for I do perceive but cold demeanor in Octavius' wing, and sudden push gives them the overthrow. Ride, ride, Miss Alton, let them all come down! Cassius, Brutus gave the word too early, who, having some advantage on Octavius, took it too eagerly. His soldiers fell to spoil, whilst we by Antony are all in clothes. Fly for the rock, my lord, fly for the rock. More came these in your tents. This hill is far enough. Look, look, Titanius, are those my tents where I perceive the fire? They are, my lady. 
name is if thou lovest me. Mount thou my horse and hide thy spurs in him, and ride them to yon troops and here again, that I may rest assured with a yonder troops of friend or enemy. I will be here again, even with a thought. Guards, go higher up my hand. Tell me what thou knowest about the field. <coughs> oh, my lord! What news? The tennis is enclosed, round about the horsemen, the men came on the spur. Get his spurs on! Now, we're almost on him! Now, to tell us! Now, some light! Oh, he likes to! He's taken! <coughs>
Safe, Antony. Brutus is safe enough. I dare assure thee, no enemy shall take alive the noble Brutus. The gods defend him from so great a shame. When you do find him, alive or dead, it will be like Brutus, like himself. I is no less and worse. Keep this man safe. Give him all kindness. I'd rather have such men my friends than enemies. Go and see if Brutus be alive or dead, and bring the sword unto Octavius his tent. Go. Rest on this rock. Statilia showed the torchlight, but my lord, he came not back. He is retained or slain. Sit thee down. Clytus, slain is the word. It is a deed in fashion. Hark thee, Clytus. What? I, my lord? No, not for the world. Peace, then, no words. I'd rather kill myself. Hark, D'Artagnus. Shall I do such a deed? Oh, Gardenis. Oh, Clydus. What the request of Brutus make to thee? To kill him, Clydus. Look, he meditates. Now is that noble vessel full of grief that it runs over even at his eyes. Good Volumnius, listen to word. What's this, my lord? By this, Volumnius. The ghost of Caesar hath appeared to me two several times by night at Sardis once. This last night, here in Philippi Fields, I know my hour is come. Not so much. Nay, I am sure it is, Volumnius. Thou seest the world, Volumnius, how it goes. Our enemies have beat us to the pit. It is more worthy to leap in ourselves and tarry till they push us. Volumnius, thou knowest that we two went to school together. Even for that, our love of old, I pray thee, hold on my sword hilts while I run on it. That's not an office for a friend, my lord. Fly, fly, my lord. There's no tearing here. Farewell to you. And to you, and to you, Volumnius. Straight up. Now it's been all this while asleep. Farewell to thee too, Straight up. Good countryman, my heart doth joy, yet yet in all my life I found no man but who was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day. More than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto you. So fare you well at once. For Brutus' tongue hath almost ended his life's history. Night hangs upon mine eyes. My bones would rest that have but labored to attain this hour. Fly, my lord, fly! Hence, I will follow. I pity you, straight on. Stay thou by thy lord. Thou art a fellow of a good respect. Thy life hath had some snatch of honor in it. Hold then my sword, and turn away thy face while I run on it. Wilt thou stray on? Give me your hand first. Fare you well, my lord. Farewell, good stray <laughs>
this was the noblest Roman of them all. He only, in general honest thought, and common good all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature should but stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. According to his virtue, let us use him, with all respect and rites of funeral. Within my tent this night, his bones shall lie, much like a soldier, honorably ordered. So call the field to rest, and let's away, depart the glories of this happy day. 